Um, well, look, good. Um, um, so, look, here we are. We're all. Um, uh, thank you very much for doing me the honour of showing up on a Friday night. We are, I think, um, probably everybody here cares about education of our children. There's some 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 people are teachers from and uh, some from the university department. So, so uh, hands up, teachers. Um, very good. Thank you so much for coming. You are my heroes and heroines. And uh, every, everybody else. So hands up, everybody else from the university department. Good. So it's about half and half. Good. Um, Yes, and Julie gets to do both. <laughs> so I, I, because I didn't really know the audience, what, I've, what I was planning to do was to um, do a, a sort of quick skirmish through um, the revolution in the way we're envisaging um, understanding computing as a school subject. Um, I think this will be quite familiar to some of you, but maybe not all of you, but finishing with a sort of kind of a call to action for all the non-teachers to stand up and help the teachers, right? And then, um, uh, I, I want to um, flip into um, sort of 30 minutes of worth of looking at what, what is ChatGPT doing for us? Actually, I shan't say so much about that, but how does AI actually work? But part of the, this whole game is we're trying to blow away the magic from computing. So instead of thinking of computers as strange magical devices, we can think of them as things we can understand that have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so, uh, so that's my plan. But actually, I would be very happy if we, you know, digressed into some other conversation. And I threw away all my slides, you know, full of intelligent people here. So but but I, and it would be much more fun for me, if you would respond with questions and observa observations, particularly, because all of you have a lot of wisdom about education that I don't have, um, rather than just allowing me to rant. Is that is that all right? So we'll and we'll finish on time somehow, regardless. OK. So here is um, uh, one of my favorite tools. It is three and a half kilograms of forged steel um, and uh, a monkey wrench here. And I call your attention to the label on this device. It says, guaranteed forever. <laughs> which I thought was a, I didn't know it when I bought this thing, but it is a lovely label, right? That exhibits a certain confidence in your product, right? And also a certain technological stability about the world, right? Now, here is our <laughs> profession, right? <laughs> this is not guaranteed forever, right? We're mired in complexity. We're always desperately trying to fix it. So, uh, so what are we going to do when it comes to um, trying to, uh, give our children an excellent education in this stuff rather than in, 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 uh, in this stuff. Um, so this is the problem that I started to grapple with when I was talking to my children um, over the, uh, the um, dinner table. Um, when they were, uh, this was back in about 2005, six. they were studying ICT at the time. And they, to my dismay, they regarded it with contempt. Right? They, they felt as if they knew all this stuff and they were being taught how to underline in PowerPoint and it was extremely dull and boring. And um, I was unable to make a connection between the subject that I thought was so interesting and diverse and fascinating and deep and rich that I devoted my professional life to it and the subject that they were studying at school. I felt that if it was a bi I was a biologist, I'd have been able to see some connection, but not as a computer scientist. That was bad. So um, what to do? So. Um, that led to the formation of CAS, which I think m almost all of you will have heard about, Computing at School, a sort of guerrilla organization. Um, Tig was an early uh, member. He's wearing a nice little um, badge on his uh, sweatshirt about it. So CAS has been, I think, started as four people in Cambridge. Um, and uh, now it's got, you know, 20 or 30,000 members. It's in you know, So it's, it was one of these things that was more successful than you could ever um, have imagined, I think had quite a big effect on what has happened in the education in our country. So, um, and then what happened, so the first thing that we wanted to do with CAS was to say, well, what is it that we want? It's no good saying what we don't want. We have to say what, what we do want. Um, so, and uh, this is a little bit of retrospective um, rationalization. I love this statement by Richard Riley about what we're trying to do in education. We're trying to educate children for jobs that don't exist using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems of which we are not yet aware. And I find this kind of lovely aspirational story about what education is about. Not a whole lot of recall and rote knowledge, but a kind of intellectual capability of dealing with successive ways of technological change. So what are we to do? How, how are we to do that? So this is my little digest of what schools uh, do. They, they try to address this question, which they have always addressed, Right? through teaching a mixture of disciplines and skills. So by disciplines, I mean things like ideas, knowledges, principles, and techniques. And by skills, I mean stuff that's associated with artifacts and devices, products and businesses and organizations. Right? And you might think of, I put sort of subjects that you might think of here. 
So schools have always taught this balance, and I think it's a mistake. Though, you know, the, the, the current trend for the knowledge-rich curriculum tends to put more emphasis on the stuff on the left. Um, and I think there's a, there's a constant tension at school here, but I think we just have to acknowledge that it's not one or the other, we have to do both. And that what had happened with um, ICT was that it just got pushed over to the left. That was all, right. that was our problem. We've become focused on, it was in the title of the subject, information and communication technology. Well, it said in the subject, this is about the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, so, um, oh, I think we'll just, I'm, I'm uh, yes, yeah, so all, all, all the new curriculum does, the, the, what we tried to articulate in CAS was just to try to rebalance this story. Um, so, yes. I'm sorry to break your flow, but no, no, this is the point. When I started my PGC back in 2003, uh, the, the lecturer of the, the uh, PGC program said, here are your books, how to teach, and it was Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Excel. Yes. Microsoft. <laughs> I said, okay. And he said, well, there's no funding, there's no resources, so commerce has stepped in and filled that void, so maybe that's where ICT... I mean, it came from, because it certainly came from... So I think historically what happened was, first there were sort of um, uh, BBC micros, and so everyone was programming in BASIC. And then PCs became quite widespread, but hadn't made them way into people's homes. And everybody, including the, the government, said, well, clearly children should learn how to use um, uh, these uh, office productivity tools. But they weren't available at home. Then they became available at home, so that children were using them at home as well. So I don't think it was just a takeover bid by um, companies. I think it was driven by a legitimate uh, desire that children should be educated in the, you know, in the in the stuff that they would find useful in the workplace. Um, and I don't think it was. I don't think it was driven from. I think there was an employer demand, yes, but I think it was responded to fairly eagerly by the, um, certainly by the government, by the educational Blair, establishment. Basically, Blair Blair pushed ICT in because there were demands from industry for a an IT literate workforce, which businesses were screaming for it and they didn't have it. But Tig, wouldn't you say there was some, also some response from teachers and schools that that was a legitimate thing, that was a legitimate part of what the schools should do? The problem is there's a pendulum of the scale with IT over here and computing here and government's reactions tend to be from swinging from one side to the other side and they yeah. don't know the middle exists. So, so, so <laughs> their administration went straight to ICT and that stayed the case until companies were screaming out, we used to get programmers, so, you know, <laughs> Derek Schmidt faked 30 seconds out of an hour's talk taken out of context is what led Gove to scrub IT and put computing in. It's scary it's but true. Back the other way. And in instead of saying, yes. yeah, now the Royal Society have always, I mean, so, I, we, you were involved in the Royal Society before. Yeah. So yeah. Shut down a re restart report said, look, what you need is computer science, digital literacy, and IT. There are three strands of computing, and you need them all in fairly careful balance. So what you need to do is, Train up about 8,000 computing teachers and then gradually just move the curriculum across. So, good old Mr. Gove scrapped IT and put computing in place. Um, and luckily, Simon and Kaz and folks like that were around to say, well, you need those 8,000 teachers. Where are they coming from? And that's really where Kaz started getting funding and where they But the ICT came from Blair's government, which a lot of that was from industry saying, we need these skills now. But the problem is, Governments listen to who screams loudest. And the people screaming loudest are the people with a shortage. The software industry don't turn around to government and go, we need to keep the software engineers you're developing. We need to keep more of these because they've got them and they're happy. It's not until there's a void, which is why the pendulum never reaches the middle. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Everybody, it's difficult to organize societies. Everyone is trying to do the right thing. Mm. There are very few evil you know, operators in this world. Or well, some, but... Um, uh, it's not so much in education, yes. <laughs> All right, um, good. So here's the vision, right? Um, and I, I, think, I think this is the vision to which we all subscribe. I think I'm going to leave it up for a moment to see whether you really do, right? That all children, this is, I mean, it's quite a bold statement, right? I still, and I don't think any other country in the world makes a statement as explicit as this, that every child should study computer science in the same way that they do maths and natural science, that is at an elementary level initially, but that means that, that this means every child from primary school onwards, um, because it will, for the same reasons as they study maths and natural science, that is because it will equip them to deal with the natural and digital and mathematical world that surrounds them so ubiquitously. Yeah, Julie. Um, can you push your mic? Um, Louder, Julie. I, I agree with this. I can sign up to this on, uh, on one level, but it's very much what rather than how. Uh -huh. And it's, it's 
just as they do in maths, natural science, and primary school onwards. But um, why is it that young people start in primary school learning their multiplication tables and they come out at the end of GCSE not learning their multiplication tables? Why is it that maths is so prescriptive? I mean, it's always been done this way, so all always will be this way. And you get lots of young people who are maths phobic when if they were to look at patterns and the structure of things and how one thing relates to another, more investigative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say the same with computer science. Mm -hmm. It's that it's the how and the context in which, rather than just primarily the what. But is that not our job to, to cross-link those curriculum? Yes, it so, is. So it's down on us as teachers to, but can we do to it link those. When there are GCSEs and Cranley yeah. and... You can, I can argue you can, but does everybody do that? But that's, I mean, part of, part of Simon's... Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the other one issue is how many computing teachers are there? Because if the person delivering Key Stage 3 teaches history normally mm -hmm. and hasn't studied computer science, having the knowledge yeah. to be able to cross the topics, knowing that actually the reason I've got two, five, six colours in it, in, in a gift is because it's an eight-bit binary number, yes. is not inherent unless you've studied the subject. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to be devil's advocate now. Um, we've got the what, and we've got the how. We've got the content, and we've got the process. Um, I was at a seminar, a Raspberry Pi seminar, called Rob from, he said, really good wrong way around. With the internet, and with the access to so much data, so much information, then surely you need to put skills there. Yes, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, downplay the content because the content is necessary because you have if you haven't got the content you've got nothing with which you can play but it's that play <laughs> it's that process but the the content is is necessary otherwise what you could play with it's like giving a child a sound pit with no sound so you need it but it's the process it's what you do with it it's that problem solving it's um it's the dynamic part of learning i think we've lost that the schools that, um, that I've been involved in, in actually the teaching, there's so much geared towards cramming, towards GCSEs, and, mm -hmm. and the curriculum is geared towards getting the information over. Where my hypothesis is if you focus on the student, the subject, the shown, you know, it's shown that learning's not siloed, but there's an integration of the subjects. But it's not a top down. You can't say, senior leadership can't say that you've got to that link, that link, that link, that link, that It's actually like CAS. CAS is brilliant because then you've got the, it's bottom up rather than top down. And it's the, it's, it's more organic rather than mechanistic. But so is that a critique that you could apply to every subject or the GCC? I totally agree. Yes. So the next one is yeah, education. Yeah. I'm looking around me at teachers in the room. Yes. How many of your key stage three curricula aren't geared to prep them pre GCSE? How many of your key stage threes are looking at producing a rounded individual who may or may not go beyond year nine? Thoughts? So, uh, so I think I feel as if this is a there's a kind of uh, I think I said it earlier. I think there's a false dichotomy between disciplines and skills, right? And I would be the first to agree that what, here I put discipline, not just skill, but I would certainly not say discipline, not skill, right? Because you know it's like saying how could you learn physics without doing any lab work, right? But at the same time, if you just do lab work but no physics, you don't have any way to understand that you know you're not going to re reinvent Newton's laws of motion. It's a very inefficient way to do it. So. You need to have the subject discipline along with plenty of practical applications and context. Now, I'd be the first to then say what has happened in practice is that we were talking about this earlier about qualifications, is that our qualification structure tends to drive students into what has ended up being a pretty academic um, uh, GCSE in computer science. We've lost any kind of applied GCSE and that has very bad consequences. And in fact, that's exactly the topic that I want to talk to Nick Gibb about on Monday. Um, so, but. But there's a, there's a sort of, there's a question of, are we executing well? And I think we'd have, we'd have lots to say about that. But I think foundationally, we want to treat computing like we do maths and natural science. That is something that every child has access to, to rather than as a narrow vocational skill that some children, the software developers of the future, get. That's the, yeah. You, I think you would sign up to that part. Maths and science have got to change as well. 
Because you've got to have more lab work, because there isn't the lab work yeah. in, in schools anymore, really. Well, that's the part of the continuous assessment and course work as part of these things rather than yeah. just. Yeah. Yes. And indeed, the whole, I've got a whole other talk, but I'm very interested in the, the symbiosis between mathematics and computer science. I often say, in fact, this will come up in the second half, uh, that mathematics is, comp no, computer science is mathematics made incarnate, made concrete, made executable, right? So that you can, you can, um, uh, you know, so computer science is sort of quintessentially an executable, concrete, tangible, practical subject that can actually bring mathematics to life. This actually is a, sort of fits with Conrad's um, stuff as well. So I'd love to, I'd love at Key Stage 3 for there not to be math classes and computing classes, but just maths and computing. But that's even more demanding of Key Stage 3 teachers. <laughs> it is possible, yes. Um, so what else do I want to say? Oh, just that, um, every child, only the education system reaches every child. This is important for the non-teachers among us that they, this is education, the education system of our nation is a very powerful way to reach every child. After school clubs and um, coded dojos are fantastic, but they reach um, middle class, you know, the, uh, the children of pushy parents, pushy, pushy middle class parents, right? We want to reach every child, especially disadvantaged children. The education system has our route into that. Um, it, it's not a silver bullet, Right, still really hard, but it's a, it's there with every child, and that's an amazing thing. Okay, good. Right, so that's that. That's how, that was sort of the, uh, as it were, Kaz's vision. Then, as many of you will know, what then then happened is we got lucky. Right, we wrote a curriculum for computer science back in 2010, and then Michael Gove, for all his faults, he did actually start this review of the national curriculum, and. Um, uh, the Royal Society helped with this report, and Michael Gove in the end said, oh, okay, yes, we'll do this. Um, and uh, so we were, as it were, at the, just at the point which you might think we were pushing water uphill, suddenly we discovered the water we wanted to push was flowing downhill, and we could say to the department, look, you know you have a problem with ICT, and we actually have a vision, you know, an articular vision for what you might do about it. So that was pretty amazing. So in the end, we got to write this National curriculum. So, so some, not, maybe not all of you have seen this. I'm still quite proud about it, though I'm terribly biased because I chaired the committee that wrote it. Every child can understand and apply the fundamental principles and concepts of computer science, can analyze programs in computational terms, and have repeated experience of writing this practical stuff, right? And then, but let's not throw away information technology and, and be a competent, confident, and creative user of information and communication technologies. So, I think these are still pretty good aims. Pretty good aims. Um, hard to execute on, but, but, and I'm proud that we have, you know, that, that our country actually says that in black and white. Other countries sort of tiptoe around it and talk about digital technologies. So there you are, that's a good start. It yeah. comes out in the uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation Education Research Seminars uh -huh. that this country, other countries look at what this country is doing yeah. uh, to find their way forward. Yeah, so they're watching us, and that is, puts us extra pressure on us, because not only do we not want to screw it up because our children matter a lot, but also because everybody else is going to say, well, they screwed it up, so we don't want to do that. So it's really important to get this right. Okay. Um, so uh, then that led, oh, five years later, uh, then there was a sort of period here in which the new curriculum launched in 2014, but the government was short of money at the time, it was short of money, and said, well, just, you know, get on with it, chaps. Completely new subject launched at school level, just have a go. Um, they dribbled about a million pounds a year into CAS, which started the Network of Excellence, in which Southampton was a leading participant, right, and ran a very great regional centre right here, at base at the university, right? I am correct, yeah. Um, and then Ross had to produce another report and finally the government said, oh, actually, yes, funny you should mention that. It would be a good idea to have a professional development program for computer teachers. That's the National Center for Computing Education, which has actually been renewed for another two and a half years. So that's really good. Um, it's a big government behemoth, but it's doing good, good work. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the story that's um, been going on now. So, so you might think then, um, uh, and people often say to me, as people have not been connected with education, well, perhaps we're, we're done, right? We should be, um, uh, we can just relax and uh, go back to our day jobs. Um, but actually, uh, the reality in schools, as we've been, I think, has come out already from this conversation, is pretty patchy. And it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle, right? It's a struggle because there are, like, there's a recruitment target for 1,100 new computing teachers this year, and we've managed to recruit 300 as a nation in England. That's, that's a big shortfall. 
So schools are desperate to get teachers. Teacher, Tig, tell us about your trainees. Yeah, we've recruited <coughs> hundreds, but I started with nine this year. Four of them shouldn't have been in the classroom to start with, and they're gone. And of the ones that are left, two of them immediately after two weeks in the classroom went, good God, stuff this, and went straight to software development. And the three that are left, all of them were offered multiple jobs before Christmas, one of whom was a head of department. Hasn't even got to Christmas in his training year, and he's been offered a whole role next year. So, short, short, long story short, you know, uh, the, 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 there was a lot to do. Uh, and I think it's too important to just say the schools can handle it. Um, and I just want to give a shout out here to the teachers in the room. You are truly my heroes at Nehoans. I'm a school governor. Every time I walk on the site of the school, I am awed by the commitment and expertise and dedication of teachers. I think you are fantastic. Um, and it's jolly hard being a computing teacher. It's hard enough being a teacher. It's harder being a computing teacher. I've written down some of the things that I, the Scottish teacher said, it's me, me or me in my school. Um, so quite, they, some of them feel quite lonely and isolated. That's partly what CAS is about. So I want to say that as, um, uh, you know, this is, so this is my thank you to you. Um, and as, uni you know, university academics and IT professionals like I am, I think we owe it to our children and to our, you know, incredibly dedicated teachers to prop them up, right? And that, that our teachers are very high point of leverage. If we can just make Peter, you know, just bright eyed and bushy tailed and valued and loved and supported and resourced adequately with, you know, floods, floods of volunteers to help him, he will influence hundreds or thousands of students in a you know, relatively short period of time. Um, compared to running face-to-face -face student events, you know, pupil facing events, that's very efficient. Right? So, money, and time. <laughs> money and time. That's right. Um, so this is really my call to, for this is for the for everybody who isn't a teacher here. This is my my call to you. I think that we, that we should each individually think about what we can do to help this revolution turn out well. Um, and individually, we can um, you know uh, talk to our local schools, the schools our children go to, or, or find find a way to um, find a way to a school. Stand alongside the teachers there. Don't tell them what to do. Find out what they need. Um, how can they help it? Um, become a school governor, run a co-club, become a STEM ambassador. There are quite a lot of things you can do as an individual. Um, and I think together, and we were having a really good conversation about this earlier, that collectively we can do things. The department here has in the past been pretty active in this space, been pretty busy with COVID and other things more recently, but maybe can get back um, a bit more actively now. We talked a bit about the university ambassador scheme. Uh, which I love. This is where undergraduates, um, as a credit bearing part of their undergraduate computer science course, uh, spend a module um, interacting with the school in some way. Um, and I think out of that, you may get more. Uh, uh, it's a tick on there, but I'm just going to say any teachers in the room, if you want to connect with the university, if you want to get involved in the university, whether it's sending your kids to the uni to see stuff, doing WOW events, A level events, or getting lecturers in your classroom to do stuff with your kids. Yeah. These three guys here and really yes. just there. Uh, please, please, why don't you just stand up and introduce yes. yourself so you know who you, who you all are to the teachers. They are in charge of getting the university into schools. And the biggest yes. problem from a university's perspective is knowing who to speak to in a school yeah. to get to a computing yeah. teacher. Yeah, so, so Rina, just introduce yourself and what you do. I'm Rina, I look after outreach. So when I come to school, you can see me, come to university and see me. And we'll sort you out. Um, if you're one of our WP schools, social mobility schools, you can get these brief supply teachers to cover you and coaches to bring bring you in. But if you see me, we'll see if you're on ice, we'll get you sorted. And you'll have a lovely day. I think your school came down and they, they had a bad time. Again, you've got another time next week. And uh, I'm Nick Gibbons. I'm in charge of our undergraduate computer science program. So I see it from when they leave your schools and when they arrive here. Oh, I'm Les Carr. Um, I have been kind of uh, sort of working sort of with teachers, with Tig and Phil Bag and um, people sort of regionally, um, just to try and encourage things. I set up uh, perhaps my biggest contribution um, to this is I set up a, an activity called Computing and Cake. Uh, and invited teachers around to learn about computers and eat cake. He's being modest. School. Les is one of the reasons why the CAS Regional Centre was here and not somewhere else. It was the cake. It was the cake. <laughs> the cake is clearly legendary, so you could just have more cake. It's just so important. Though, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity, but I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm very passionate about what makes people tick, and education is, is a key thing for me. Um, I've always enjoyed 
solving the, the invisible barrier for a student. So whenever I see an opportunity to work with schools or anybody who's interested in education, I take it. So when I see an opportunity, I'll take advantage of it. So if there is an opportunity to work with the university, please come to me and I'll do what I can to facilitate. And his name is Norfolk. Norfolk. Yeah, <laughs> and sorry. he's Norfolk. one of our lead educators. So. <laughs> Thank you, and most of you are funded to be high on If you want to start with computers in school at some point, give me a shout, I'll probably be involved. So I think you're hearing a pretty unambiguous open door message um, here, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. Um, OK, so, uh, so much for that. Uh, so now, a little change of gear. Uh, so let's see. Um, uh, we're supposed to finish at half past, right? So we're going to do 20 minutes on AI. Is that all right? Um, now, I, so, um, for those of you who know a lot about artificial intelligence, treat this as um, this is the kind of talk you could you could imagine giving, you know, in a school or to some teachers. And just as, as a, this is my attempt to explain how AI works in sort of school friendly language. I don't know how successful I'll be. Maybe you can help calibrate me. Um, but, uh, but I really think that we should, we should attempt to blow away the magic, especially with all this um, uh, stuff that's going on. So those of you who do know about, know about AI, I'm very open to you just saying, actually, Simon, that's not quite right, because then we'll all be better informed, including me. Um, so we'll just go. We'll do, we'll do 20 minutes, and then we'll have more wine. All right? Um, and I'm, uh, the, the other reason for, um, for doing this for the, for the teacher end is that I was thinking that your students will probably be asking you a lot about this stuff. And I would love it if that they ended up with some visceral sense about not just what AI can do, which now is pretty awesome, um, but also some well-informed sense of how it does it, and therefore what strengths and weaknesses might be. That's my goal. OK, um, Okay. so very quickly then, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the, uh, the popular view is AI is simply magic, right? You, you feed it pictures of cats, and it says, yes, cat. You feed it, you say, uh, um, you know, can you write my essay? And it spits out an essay. Um, so, um, but this idea about magic is, is bad. I think I've just I've said this already, so we'll skip it. So um, the first interesting thing about AI, from my, my point of view, is it's a completely different way of explaining to a computer what you want it to do. The traditional way of explaining to a computer what you want to do is to write a Python program or a Haskell program or a Fortran program. From this perspective, they're all the same. Um, and that's good for some things, but not very well for recognizing cats. You can, you can try to write a Python program to recognize cats, but it's pretty hard. It doesn't work very well. So the, you know, the machine learning approach is just a, it's like instead of approaching it from the West, we'll approach it from the East. It's a, just a completely different way of thinking about how you can tell a computer what to do. And that all by itself is an interesting perspective for a young person who has become to think that all of computing is programming in Python. Right? This is just end run around the entire process of what you want a computer to do. Fine. So, um, uh, right. So I'm going to then tackle the, the question about, oh, it's OK, so how does it work? How can we blow away the magic through a, a very small uh, machine learning program that's going to um, uh, recognize biscuits. So these biscuits are made out of a rather simple recipe of flour, butter, and sugar, right? X kilograms of flour, Y of butter, and the balance of sugar, and we bake them, and then we feed them to small children, and we see whether they like them or not. Um, okay, so uh, we, we make a table saying, here's the amount of flour, butter, butter, balance with sugar. We feed it to the child, and we make a table of this, and we make a big table like this, and we plot them on some kind of scatter plot. Uh, this is the amount of flour, this is the amount of butter, um, orange dots are bad biscuits, blue dots are good biscuits. And then we're going to try to learn from this data which are the bad ones. And if I show you this, you say, Chiman, that's pretty simple. Right? What have we got to do? I've just got to somehow draw a line that separates them. That shouldn't be so hard, should it? It might be harder if the configuration was a bit different. We'll come to that. So, so what do we mean by a line? Well, we got, if we're going to get a computer to execute this, we've just got to be a bit more precise about lines. So because we're, you know, we've done GCSE maths, we say oh, a line is described by you know, y equals ax plus b. So, um, so what's a and b, the parameters of the line? That says its slope and its intercept on the y-axis up here. Um, but actually, this doesn't work very well if the line you wanted was vertical. Why does that not work so well? If the line you wanted was very steep or even vertical, Mm, with what? You just remove most of it and you end up with a line. 
Well, y equals a uh, thousand x, was a is the slope of the line, right? So y equals a thousand x, a million x. Oh, to get it vertical, it would have to be infinity x, and computers aren't very good at that. So this does not work very, very well. So it turns out that a much better thing to do is to um, describe your line like this. And this is just a, you know, it's like an, a little piece of mathematics that just says, well, if we describe the points on the line are x's and y's, such that ax plus by plus c is equal to zero. Now, it's just another way of describing lines. And it turns out this just works beautifully for describing both horizontal lines and vertical lines. It's just a little shift of perspective. And I've just written down here this, uh, the thing we were talking about earlier. I love the way that just a little piece of maths that you might get come in your maths class has turned out to be jolly useful in your computer science class. I like that. OK. So this is, this is how we're going to describe our line. Um, so, uh, so now, um, if a is 0, then I get a horizontal line. If b is 0, I get a vertical line. So it works very nice and uniformly. OK. Um, so then, um, now then, the, the bad biscuits now, if I compute, if I've got a particular x, y point, I compute ax plus by plus c, it's going to be less than 0 down here, bigger than 0 up here. So now I'm looking at the, um, you know, uh, the uh, compute t computing teachers around the table. Is all this completely obvious at this point? Or because I'm, I'm just ranting along quickly because I'm, uh, I don't want to keep you from your wine, but I would rather stop soon, I would rather pause. So your, your formula was, uh, was x is uh, flour, y is flour, y is flour, y is flour, and sugar is 1 minus x. That's right, sugar is the rest. So, it's so one kilogram surely your, your good biscuits are going to have the least amount of sugar. Um, it looks as if that's the way these ones are. That, no, they got they got lots of the good ones seem to have quite a lot of flour and quite a lot of butter, so they're not having much sugar. That's true. Yes. Surely that would make a worse biscuit. <laughs> I'm not, con not. I'm not telling you this data is uh, f uh, faithful to reality. <laughs> I wasn't. Ex I wasn't actually expecting this to be, you know, gastronomically faithful. <laughs> Surely, also, both clusters have the same ratio of flour and butter. It's just the sugar that's changing between those two. Um, well, some of these have. I mean, these guys have more flour and, and butter, and therefore less sugar. So yes, so, yeah. and I haven't got any data down here. So I don't. No, that's, that's what I mean. Oh, I haven't got any evidence down here. I just didn't. I didn't bake those. They weren't in my table. That's a problem. We'll come to that. OK. Good. Anybody else? This is the, this is the plan. So the plan is, we're just going to hope that our good biscuits and bad biscuits will be separated by a line. We're going to try to find A, B, and C that will separate the clusters. That's, that's the, the problem. Right? So how do we do that? Well, um, oh, let's skip this. Right. So uh, we're going to start off with a random A, B, and C. That's some random line. And then we're going to feed it some mispredicted biscuits and say, ah, oh, this, is, this is a biscuit that it predicted the wrong, right? So this guy here, um, it says bad biscuit, and actually it's blue, it's good biscuit. So we'd like to sort of tug the line round a bit to give it a better chance of being the right side of the biscuit. So we've got to adjust A, B, and C a little bit to each time. So we're going to iteratively uh, uh, find a mispredicted biscuit, adjust A, B, and C, find another mispredicted biscuit, adjust A, B, and C, and just keep doing that, moving A, B, and C a little bit each time until, with luck, it'll separate the two. So effectively, you're saying that's our training data. That's the training so, data, yes. That table, that table was the training data, yes. That's what we're saying. That's the evidence we give to the thing. We're trying to make it learn from that what good or bad means. But when you say learn from that what good or bad means sounds frightfully mysterious and intelligent, but, but this is what I mean about blowing away the magic. Learn from that what good and bad means has turned into figure out A, B, and C, right, by adjusting them slowly till they get separated. So it's nice. So it brings it right down to reality. Yeah. OK? So uh, how are we going to adjust A, B, and C? So I'm going to skip this bit, because um, adjusting A, B, and C sounds, uh, how could we do that? Um, well, uh, I figured that. You know, certainly an A-level student would have no problem with this. An A-level math student would have no problem with this. And I reckon that if I was given, a, you know, uh, certainly a top set GCSE class, I reckon I could get them to say, uh, I could kind of more or less get this. But I, maybe I'm just fantasizing. You would be able to tell me more accurately. Because um, th the question is, how do I adjust A, B, and C to make the output more positive? So, um, and that's a kind of what you, you want to adjust by most 
the A, B, and C that affects the output the most. Right? So you'd like to know the sensitivity of the output to A, B, and C. Right? Does that make sense? Um, because if C doesn't affect the output, then adjusting C won't make the slightest difference to the prediction for this biscuit. If adjusting A uh, makes a big difference, we should probably adjust that you know, preferentially than the other ones that don't affect it very much. Does that make sense? Right? So what we want to know is how sensitive is the output to A, B, and C for particular values of X and Y. So I'm going to fix X and Y, that one biscuit, and figure out how sensitive the output is to A, B, and C, and adjust A, B, and C, where I adjust the more sensitive one by more. That's all. That's all. So, and how do I do that? I've, all I've, I've just got to differentiate AX plus BY plus C with respect to A. Right? Now, this is why I say, okay, so differentiation A level, but this is only differentiation of a linear equation. You could almost do it by intuition if you were doing a GCSE class, right? But certainly by the time you're in A level and you've seen derivatives, this is trivial, right? So, so actually these derivatives turn out to be really simple. So here's the summary algorithm. We just adjust A by the, uh, you know, in the direction of X by the, by the amount of it. And what's this alpha thing? Alpha is how much do we adjust it by? One mispredicted big system, how much do we push it by? Alpha, maybe alpha is a small number, like 0.01. We'll tug it slowly. And so there's a whole amount of hocus pocus into what alpha is and how, you know, whether alpha stays fixed or changes over time. Um, that's the learning rate. So um, this is the summary of, the, this is the essence of, that's, I was I'm quite amazed when somebody, I said to Andrew Fitzgibbon, who's my colleague at Microsoft, when I learned this stuff, I said, Andrew, is that really all there is to machine learning? He said, yes, Simon, this is it. So this is the essence of machine learning, this back propagation algorithm that just involves um, finding mispredicted outputs and adjusting the input slightly by taking the derivative of the, um, the equation that derives the output. So simple, so simple. Julie, yes. Can I just mention something that I mentioned on the um, CAS? Big one? Can I just mention something about the neuroscience that goes with the, the with this presentation? Yes. Um, I think this is from a, from a child, um, a, a toddler, who's taking in lots of data, big data, and this is affecting the development of the neural pathways. So we're taking, as human beings, we're taking in all of this data all the time. And how we process it depends, uh, determines who we are and what we are. But experience, this is why I'm thinking about the ABC as you're talking. That A, B, and C, those experiences alter what's going on in our brain. So basically, I'm, 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 I'm suggesting that there's a correlation between machine learning, and also our development, neural development? Well, of course, m the, the whole subject of machine learning was initially developed as to sort of try to imitate the limited amount that we understood about the brain. Now, whether it does actually accurately reflect what happens in brains, probably brains are much more complicated, they actually. Have, um, well. Yes, there are zillions of stuff. So it's probably a pale facsimile of what happens in the brain. But nevertheless, even though it's a pale facsimile, it can do these awesome things. Um, okay, so uh, moving uh, swiftly on. So I just want to, um, have, you, have you all played with TensorFlow Playground? Um, but if not, you should, right? If you, you have. It's fun. Um, it's what? Fun. Some. I love this. So this is TensorFlow Playground. It lets you, it's a little website, um, and you just, um, uh, you press this play button up here, and it does that iterative process I described. Boom. And so, and, and then you, this refresh button over here, it says, start off with another random line, and you can press um, play. And zoom, it'll find another line. So it's very, very entertaining. Um, and so it's like, this is what I mean by computer science is mathematics made executable. You just try it out. It, it's a sort of playful experimental experience rather than an academic one. Um, now, what about this? Now there's a problem, right? So this is, again, a, mo a sort of aha moment, I think, for... Uh, you know, even a child, you could think, okay, a line is not going to do this. If the good biscuits are all the ones around the outside, this may be also gastronomically in, in uh, uh, what's the word, uh, in implausible, but suppose they were, right? A line is not going to separate these. So what will happen? Let's try it. So we ask a TensorFlow Playground, which thoughtfully has given me a different data set over here that is like that. And, and what, is it, what does it do? Well, let's try. Um, oh, well, 
it has a go, right? It ends up with sort of sort of separating some of the goods from the bads, right? It's it's trying, it's trying, and then if I start again, it'll have a go, and it'll probably be, find a completely different line. Oh, actually, this one was rather similar. Um, let me see, find a completely different line. Oh, maybe it always likes this one for some reason. Um, but the um, oh, there now it finds a completely different one, but it started in a random place. So, um, but the the other point that I would want to make, and again to a young person, is look. It's going to make a line, and then if you feed it an x, y coordinate, it'll say good or bad, right? So it will confidently predict an answer. It won't say, actually, I haven't the faintest idea, Simon. It'll say, good biscuit, because there is a line, and the biscuit will be one side or the other. Do you see what I mean? So it doesn't tell you that it's actually not really very good at all. Um, so uh, what are we going to do? Well, we could have many lines, right? So maybe we could uh, have many lines and make them vote. Um, and this is my favorite insight from that I uh, was a complete uh, revelation to me when I first came across this. My friend Andrew is explaining this to me. He said, well, look, um, instead of having, if we were, have two lines or maybe three lines or five lines, we could maybe now draw a box around the good, good biscuits, right? That would be good. But then we have to somehow make, how, we may have to make the lines vote. How do we make them vote? Well, maybe we can have two magic boxes and connect their outputs to a third magic box. After all, if we've got a good idea, we should just reuse it. Ah, that seems cool. So maybe this is kind of like the voting from these three. Maybe we'd have five lines here, five magic boxes, each describing five different lines, and then somehow make them vote. Does that seem plausible? After all, we're just using the same learning mechanism here as we're using here. Um, so. This is the, the one piece of intellectual ideas that I'd love you to, to take away because I found it so uh, you know, orgasmically exciting to, to realize this, that if you just connect up some magic boxes like this, same magic box, A, X plus B, Y plus C, A, X plus B, Y plus C, but we sort of, with different parameters, it's A3, B3, C3, A2, B2, C2. Have I made any progress? Yeah, I know. But, but, are, are things, but you see, so, so uh, the, the, the underlying intuition was the output of the first layer, I'm just going to feed into the second layer, which is some kind of voting mechanism, because it's doing the same kind of thing, that is learning how what the outputs of the first layer mean in terms of biscuit, biscuit classification. But if you do this, then I think some of you will realize that we have made no progress because, because what? I've got the same output. Well, I mean, it depends what A3 and B3 and C3 are, right? It's not necessarily, I mean, of course I want two inputs and one output in the end. Okay, so this is the, this is the aha moment. Are you ready for it? Hmm? You ready? Uh, look, just calculate. This is back to use elementary mathematics. Now we're into uh, key stage three again. What is this whole function? Well, it's A3 times P, this is P and Q, I should have labeled, there's P and Q. A3 times P plus B3 times Q plus C3. And what's P? Oh, it's just A1X plus, it's just this thing, right? Then just do simple algebra. And, and what do I get is something times X and something times Y and plus something. Oh, that was what one magic box did. In other words, this whole complicated assembly can do no more than the original AX plus BY plus C could do. No more. It just does a, in a more complicated way. So that's an insight already. And so these clever chaps who did this 30 years ago knew this. But what they discovered was that all you need to do, look how, you, look how simple it is to fix. But this is a serious problem, right? No, no progress whatsoever. All you need to do is to add a little bit of non-linearity, which sounds, when Andrew first told me this, I thought, Andrew, kind of, kind of, give me a break. What do you mean? Um, all he means is just add a little box here that implements this function. The input is a number. Its output is zero if the input is less than zero, and otherwise it's the input, right? So it's simply, it's like a clamp. If the output goes below zero, it just cuts it off. So it's not linear in the sense this this function you know has a its graph is you know a, a kinky shape, and this simple trivially simple um, nonlinear function is enough to make the entire assemblage um, 
uh, capable of learning multiple lines and making them vote. And you can demonstrate this. Look, here is um, uh, TensorFlow program on this guy. And I'm going to add some layers. Um, uh, let's add maybe several layers. And let's make, let's make them have a few more. Um, you know, oh, dear, I didn't mean to add quite so many. Uh, how do I do this here? Um, add some more things in each layer. Um, and I don't know, I'm just working at random here in a very experimental kind of way. Um, and, oh, wow, look at that. Don't you think that's spooky? I've shown you everything. Uh, the, nothing is happening that I have not shown you. And yet, it's learned a really rather good classifier for these biscuits. All right, that's amazing. 728. Um, uh, so uh, it's a lot of fun to play with this game. So um, uh, yes, um, and every, all the learning stuff, right? That back propagation stuff about taking derivatives, exactly the same, right? You, every child who can understand this much can build a neural network and can, and can actually implement one from scratch using this. Um, okay. Uh, so then, then that leads into a long riff about what can go wrong. And we've seen some things that can, could go wrong, like you need more model capacity, more, more lines. Another thing could go wrong, which we just were mentioning earlier, is no data down here, right? So how accurate are the predictions down here going to be? That's why Google wants Frank Kayich. We don't know, exactly. That's why you get face recognition systems that recognize white faces and not black ones. But they haven't been shown any black faces. How could they possibly? recognize them well. So, but, but it becomes so obvious when you show it like this. Every child can say, of course, it couldn't possibly do a good job down here because it's never been shown any data. But for us as educators, that's a really good and quite powerful conversation about how we need more by the diversity of software. Because, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, it's 2015, I think, where Google released their, their image recognition AI to the world. And uh, African Americans were told they were gorillas. Yeah. And the reason was the entire development team were white yeah. men. Um, and it was never people had on their phones, and it was yeah, yeah. I think everyone had it. And it, and it was front page news because th let's face it, if you're Google, that was not great at PR. <laughs> and, and that is a good example of this. So we can tie to that news story. You know, we need to be careful. We need to be sensitive about that conversation. But we can link to that as an example of how we need. Yeah, why we need more diversity and how it can make an impact. Well, what I like about it is it connects all the way from the original news story right the way through in an understanding of how it actually works. It's not just, look, you need to be careful, chap says it's mysterious magic thing that can go wrong. We can see why it must go wrong. Um, and therefore, that gives you a sort of visceral, well-informed sense of what, what might be vulnerable about it. Yes, please. Um, I also find it interesting. Do you guys remember the white couples, Asian couples, black couples? Uh, thought experiment on Google. Have you tried that? If you type into Google black couples, you get pages and pages of black couples. If you type in Asian couples, you get lovely Asian couples. If you type in white couples, you get mixed race. Huh. And um, it's because, well, they think that uh, the guys, the people creating the algorithms um, in Silicon Valley believe that people are looking for white couples need re-educating or realigning oh, right. those things. Um, whether that's true or not, <laughs> that's how they do their searching. Whether it's true or not, it does give us an example of how our lives are um, controlled by people from Silicon Valley. When we go to Google and ask for the truth, and it's actually somebody's truth who's created those those sets. That, that came out yesterday on TikTok. So the U.S. Senate's grilling of the CEO of TikTok. <laughs> one of the things that came out is that if you search for certain terms in China, they don't appear or they appear very differently to the rest of the world. He said, well, actually, whilst technically the Chinese government aren't in control of TikTok, you have the ability to change your user's perception of something based on the data you provide them. So in a way, doing this, but with a human being. Um, and so one of the reasons the US have got a problem with TikTok and social media companies as a whole is that they can filter what comes back to people to change their perception of things. Um, and when grilled about that, he, he rather adroitly said, well, what about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica? <laughs> um, and that's part of the debate we need to have with our kids. You know, kids say three, the ethics debate is actually, he who controls the data controls the populace behind the data. Or she who controls the data. Or she, yeah. in fact. Uh, I think this is a really important conversation to have at the minute as well, because 
uh, there have been news articles about things like image recognition and things like that. But all the news articles that I'm seeing at the minute about ChatGPT are about people losing their jobs or I made it write, write a poem or something like that. I haven't yet seen a news article about the potential biases from ChatGPT. Mm. Um, and so just as a quick example, a quick test I did earlier today, uh, I asked ChatGPT whether or not it thought AI should be regulated. And it gave what on the surface appeared to be a very balanced answer, saying that you know, there's pros and cons. And one of the cons that it gave was that regulation might stifle innovation. So just as a, as a sort of benchmarking test, I asked it whether or not it thought medicine should be regulated. And it gave a very strong yes, it should. And not only that, but the regulation would apparently, in medicine, um, uh, promote innovation. Mm. So I asked it, why, why, why is regulation going to stifle innovation for AI but promote innovation for medicine? And it just it read awesome. like a propag propaganda article. Uh, it really did. And so I, th you know, I think we're already seeing that there is the potential for this kind of... But back to the training data, right? I'm sure that isn't built into ChatGPT. It's just that's all the articles it's read on the internet, yeah. right? Because yeah. that's all it has. Data yeah. Data. Julie. That's an approach to society anyway, but we're comfortable with people we know very well and groups we know very well. Anybody who's outside that group, that um, we have we have suspicions about. And we can manipulate how people think by the exposure to different experiences. It's, it's the idea of the in-group and the out-group. And the out-group is alien to the in-group. But in society, like, like all this training data and all these experiences and all this information on the internet, it's, it's just another incarnation of human beings trying to influence each other through psychological means. But this is just through technological means. But, uh, and our message as computing educators is to think that, oh, so, so my underlying story here, I think, is that if our young people have a well-informed understanding of how the technology works, they're more likely, they're more likely, not they're going to, but they're more likely to be able to make well-informed critical judgments. That's all. I'm conscious that we're, we're at time. So I'm not going to, I'm going to simply um, uh, stop here, except to say, there was had a bit more to say about chat GPT, but I'll skip all of that. Uh, just to say, yes, um, <coughs> Not only do they have a better chance to make have a well-informed view about it, but also they're going to get great jobs. Um, so it's kind of like, what's not to like about teaching computing as a school subject? Thank you all very much. Um, and, um, <laughs>